it's um, uh, truly a pleasure to have uh, <clears throat> uh, Professor um, Alice Wilson here. I met uh, Alice um, a few months ago in uh, London at the conference uh, called After the Event. Right, that was after the event. And, uh, and uh, that was uh, one of the first times that I went to a conference. Uh, the idea of it was based on anthropology of revolutions. And, um, and uh, so that's where we met. And uh, she gave this wonderful talk about, uh, uh, as we say in Farsi, Zofar. <laughs> um, and, um, <clears throat> and, uh, and of course, uh, for uh, not only Zofar is part of Oman and Persian Gulf and part of the mandate of our center to focus on that, but it's also pretty close to uh, the study of modern Iran, uh, because the, that was uh, the uh, Zofari revolution was one of the uh, moments that the Iranian regime under the Shah for the first time intervened in a foreign land to suppress a revolutionary movement. Um, and, uh, and also on the other side of it, there were a lot of Iranian revolutionaries who were part of the Zofari a revolutionary movement. So there was sort of a proxy war between Iranian revolutionaries and the Shah's regime happening in Zofar. Of course, this is not to take away from the significance of, of the uh, Zofari revolution itself, uh, but uh, I thought that this is a great opportunity for us to have uh, Professor Wilson here to talk about um, uh, the revolution and its aftermath. And this is uh, Professor uh, Wilson is a social anthropologist and works on um, political and economic anthropology of the Middle East and North Africa. And particularly, specifically, she focuses on these um, revolutionary moments and the transformation that happens during these moments and afterwards between the uh, ruling uh, states and their subjects. And, uh, and as we can imagine, there's an important kind of uh, historical transformative moment that shapes this relationship. And, and, uh, and we have actually, unfortunately, very few anthropologists who focus on that very, very important moment. Um, her first uh, monograph, Sovereignty in Exile, a Saharan Liberation uh, um, Movement um, uh, Governs, uh, uh, was recognized uh, by American uh, Anthropological Association uh, as one of the best manuscripts um, of 2016. And uh, the talk today is uh, based on uh, her work, uh, uh, in future book work uh, on the Zofari revolution and its aftermath. Thank you for coming. Thank you so much, Behrouz, for these really kind words of introduction. Thank you for this wonderful invitation to be here in Princeton. Thank you also to Becky, I think she's just stepped out, but for all her help in organizing uh, visiting here. We arranged this talk over the summer, and um, in the time since then, I realized there have also been very uh, intense moments in US politics, but we've had some pretty intense moments in UK politics. And this talk has really kept me going as the light at the end of the tunnel in some of those um, uh, more surprising and challenging moments. Uh, so uh, it's really a great pleasure to be here. Thank you. Thank you very much to everybody for finding time to be here. I know how many events there are, and it's a busy time in the semester as well. This is work in progress, and your comments and feedback are extremely welcome. The question that I bring to you today, and the question that lies at the heart of my current book project is what happens to ideas, networks, and values of former revolutionaries after military and political defeat of their revolution? What happens to people who in their past were revolutionaries when they're living as defeated subjects of the governing authority they once opposed? when that governing authority doesn't allow them to form a political opposition or even a formal organization of, of veterans, do the networks, ideas, and values of defeated revolution simply disappear? So we have some apparently familiar answers to some of these questions in the case of post-conflict authoritarian states 
uh, such as uh, Oman and um, some of the other states in the uh, Persian uh, Gulf monarchies. Um, and these states have been able to rely on jo not just repression for quelling political dissent, but also on patronage, on giving out material resources to try and shore up people's uh, political loyalty. The Gulf monarchies relied on these techniques in the time of the demonstrations in Oman and Bahrain in 2011, <clears throat> when the Gulf Cooperation Council countries agreed what was described at the time as a Marshall-style aid package with some 20 billion US dollars to um, you know, pump in resources to quieten things down in Bahrain and Oman. And Oman has also relied on patronage as a technique of quelling political dissent um, in its longer history, and in particular, my focus today, during the uh, Dofa War from 1965 to 1975. So this is a, an example of the kind of um, publications that you can find about Dofa, which situate it, as you can see, at this nexus of putting in resources here, you know, under the term development, as a key input for counterinsurgency. <clears throat> so uh, as the government was taking over areas from the, um, the Fari revolutionaries in the mountain hinterland, um, they set about uh, programs for material infrastructure and civilian programs, schools, roads, wells, uh, healthcare centers. But the pocket money, I'm sorry, the government was also grading pocket money that it gave out to children in these revolutionary areas as it took over areas from the revolutionaries. The more revolutionary the parents were perceived to have been in that revolutionary area, the greater the value of this pocket money given out to children in, in the late 1970s. So it gives you a sense of that connection between a patronage and trying to shore up political loyalty. And there has been a, a you know, continuation of that some of you uh, familiar um, with, well, those of you familiar with the DOFAR will know that the government from 1970 set up pro-government paramilitaries for people to fight against the insurgents and they, in, insurgents who switch sides could join those paramilitary groups. Those groups are still there 40 years later. They're staffed now by sons and relatives of the original recruits from the 1970s. And again, that keeps various people in the FAD on this payroll uh, through the guise of um, these uh, ongoing paramilitary forces. So all of this suggests how uh, patronage as well as repression is apparently effective in um, cutting off the possibility of legacies of this defeated uh, revolution. So these kinds of narratives, such as in, in this book, and, and um, there are many other um, iterations in Oman and in, in um, uh, literature about the war that repeat this kind of narrative. These kinds of narratives um, are, um, they nevertheless neglect what E.P. Thompson called counter history. By counter histories, he means histories that recover the experiences of the marginalized. <coughs> And indeed, the perspectives and experiences of the defeated revolutionaries have been marginalized from the uh, kinds of official narratives about Omani history that you'll find uh, in, in Oman. So at the time of the war, the stress was on the complete you know, government um, and overwhelming complete government victory over the insurgency. Since then, history textbooks, museums, and other forms of public discourse in Oman, just don't mention the war, war at all. And so my project is contributing to a counter history of post-war Dofar and the defeated revolutionaries. And to do this, I'm drawing on five months of fieldwork that I did in Dofar in 2015. And I'm tracing what I'm calling um, the afterlife of revolution. Um, and I, I put the stress on this being a social afterlife uh, of revolution because I'm looking at legacies of this defeated revolution and some of its social values that manifest themselves in everyday social activities amongst the Fadis, even 40 years on. Those of you interested in Dafar will know the work of the historian Abid Takriti and his book, Monsoon Revolution, which um, does very important work about presenting a revisionist counter history of the wartime period from 1965 
to 1976. So in my project, I've been using uh, ethnographic uh, fieldwork to try and continue that story of what would a counter history of Dofol look like into the post-war period. So when I think about afterlife, I'm thinking about um, uh, there being a sense of a life after death, in this case, defeat, um, a notion of ongoing influence or a later stage of life. These are um, amongst the definitions you'll find of afterlife in, in a dictionary. And I want to spend a few moments before we travel virtually to Defar to think about what are the intellectual possibilities that thinking about this afterlife can open up for us. And in this project, and here your feedback is extremely welcome. Uh, uh, this is the moment when I'm you know, developing these ideas. And at the moment, I'm really focusing on three areas of debate that I think this afterlife can open up for us. Um, in thinking about how we understand revolutions and how we understand patronage and also the significance and implications of everyday interactions in post-conflict societies. So in terms of how we think about revolutions, as uh, Behruz uh, was mentioning in his uh, introduction, we do have significant work in the social sciences and from historians about how social life can transform during two kinds of revolutionary moments. During those moments of uprising, insurrection, the protests, so there's more transient moments, but also what happens when revolutionary powers take over as a governing authority, and what does it actually mean to be living under revolutionary state power, living with, living through revolutionary state power. And it's that side of the literature that my first project about the creation of revolutionary state power for Western Sahara's refugees. Uh, so that book contributes to that side of, that, of those uh, discussions. But we know much less about the legacies of defeated revolution when ex-militants are living under a repressive authoritarian uh, uh, regime that they once opposed, uh, living under it as, as, as defeated subjects. And so in this research project, I'm trying to shed some light on uh, that scenario and to probe this notion of a, a social afterlife of revolution. And I think that this can open up some important questions about revolution, especially important for the Middle East uh, at, at this moment. Uh, given the divergent outcomes of the uprisings in 2011 and um, you know, ongoing uh, you know, unrest and, and, and conflict in the region, um, we need to think about what does it mean to be an apparently failed revolution. And we have much less analysis of what might be the legacies of these kinds of revolutions. And I think by putting that focus on a notion of an afterlife of defeated revolution, we can actually open up questions about, well, what might be the differences and overlaps between the legacies of apparently failed, apparently successful revolutions? And at what point might some of those boundaries actually blur? So I think we can rethink some of the notions of uh, what does it mean to be a revolution with legacies, expanding that to include defeated revolutions. It's also, I think, important uh, to think about how the post-Arab Spring generations of disappointed revolutionaries from the region might find opportunities to preserve for themselves legacies from that revolutionary period. And so looking to the Zafari case, now 40 years on from the official defeat, can help us uh, forge those questions for that research agenda. And it all can also help us think about how might platforms for progressive politics reappear after a defeated revolution? How might it, at a future point, become important again? And in the conclusion, I'll think about some of the references that the Fadis made to the 1970s events in their own 2011 Arab Spring protests. I think that the afterlife of revolution also opens up interesting questions for thinking about patronage, by which I mean politically motivated distribution of material resources, and the role of patronage for winning hearts and minds in post-conflict authoritarian states. As I've mentioned, there are many narratives about DOFAR as a model counterinsurgency campaign due to these multiple civilian programs to invest in infrastructure. Handouts for the Fadis that I mentioned are still ongoing in various forms. 
And uh, these practices situate the Faris in hierarchical patronage relations, reinforcing the notion of the Sultan as the patron figure and their own position as you know, differentiated uh, because they don't all get the same kinds of uh, patronage. But you know, dependence at various levels of a, of a scale of, of dependency for that patron figure. But by elucidating the ways that the Faris, uh, I mean in particular ex-revolutionary the Faris, reproduce social networks and values that hark back to their erstwhile revolution. The research that I'm doing can challenge these narratives of patronage's effectiveness in dissipating critical responses to authoritarianism. And I hope with this research to show how recipients of patronage can indeed be embedded in these underpinning hierarchical relationships of patronage, but still find ways of reproducing in parallel alternative and in some of the examples I'll show more egalitarian forms of social relations that challenge the premise of that underpinning hierarchy within patronage. It's a really exciting time in Gulf studies where we have <clears throat> scholarship that's shedding light on how citizens in various countries push the boundaries of um, dominant social relations. Amélie Lurenal's work on women pushing normal in Saudi Arabia, Pascal Menoré's work on frustrated young men letting off steam in Saudi Arabia as well. So as we're seeing um, more and more insight into Gulf societies from non-dominant uh, perspectives, this project about the ex-revolutionaries in Dofar can provide some insights into a political side of that in terms of the negotiation of different kinds of uh, social relations that are, uh, I think, accountable Point, a contrast to the um, hierarchical relations of patronage. And finally, the book uh, project gives us some material to think about post-conflict everyday life. So my background is a social, in social anthropology. I realize not everybody will be a social anthropologist here, but I'm, my hunch is that from various disciplines, people are likely to be familiar with the idea that um, forms of everyday relations, and particularly within that kinship, can be really powerful means of reproducing dominant hierarchical everyday relationships, normalizing them, legitimizing them, seeing them uh, reproduce. <clears throat> and um, I'm happy to open up in questions about various approaches within that literature and anthropology, and, and the story gets more complicated, but there's a very long, uh, a uh, pattern of these kinds of um, analyses of the apparently very conservative nature of kinship. There's a particular uh, post-conflict um, discussion around that kind of dynamic. I'm thinking here of the work of Vina Das, looking at the aftermath of organized political violence in India, but also in the Middle East, for instance, the work of Toby Kelly on Palestine, looking at how people living in the aftermath or ongoing situation of organized political violence, resort to everyday practices such as kinship relations to try and rebuild a sense of the normal, to try and get back to a sense of how life was before uh, the disruptions of the conflict. And the, the Fadi case, I think, can try, strike a distinctive note here because what I'm arguing is happening is that people are using these everyday practices and um, kinship practices amongst them not to try and reproduce the ordinary, but actually to try and reproduce the counter-hegemonic social relations that were being played out in the exceptional time of the social world they were creating as revolutionaries. So the potential of everyday post-conflict social relations to recreate not the notion of ordinary life, but a form of um, counter-hegemonic uh, social relations. So those are three of the uh, wider implications that I see for this notion of the afterlife of revolution. So I want to invite you very shortly to a virtual trip to the FAR, but uh, before that, to give you a little bit more of a context for this project, I want to um, go back to April 2016, uh, when this uh, writer and film critic, the Omani Abdullah Habib, wrote a post on Facebook. As you see here, he wrote, the Omani government has a simple and moral obligation, and that is to disclose the locations of the burial grounds of martyrs that were executed. The mass graves will not be transformed into revolutionary shrines. On the contrary, 
it is the right of a mother to visit her son's grave on Eid. And he was writing about the Zafari uh, War um, that ended in 1975, writing 41 years later. He was uh, arrested and um, eventually condemned to three years in prison. And that, he was later pardoned and uh, uh, released before serving uh, all of that time. But I mention this incident to give you a sense of how sensitive it is to talk within Oman, within the Far, about the legacies of this war. And this was, of course, an enormous constraint for my conversations with interlocutors. And I let them set the boundaries of what were they prepared uh, to share with me, stories that they, uh, uh, you know, that they uh, brought up. So serendipity played a large part in this research, and the main story I'll tell uh, shortly um, came up by accident. Um, in many cases, these were insights that it would have been hard for me to know what kind of question to ask to, to learn about uh, what interlocutors were, were telling me about. And all the interlocutors in my project have been anonymized. Um, they have different names, and I've changed some biographical details uh, for uh, the sake of anonymity. So in the wider project, I am looking at three different areas of everyday social relations through which I'm arguing that this social afterlife of defeated revolution is, is manifest and you know, transmitting these legacies of the defeated revolution. One is kinship practices, and I'll focus on that today. <clears throat> I'm happy to open up in questions on the other areas. Another is forms of everyday socializing, who some of these ex-revolutionaries hang around with. They're not a, a, a homogenous group, um, about which I'll say a, a few more words shortly. And also, I look at unofficial forms of commemoration in the context, as we just heard, of there being no opportunity for official talking about the war and, uh, for instance, the missing dead bodies from the war. I look at funeral gatherings and other kinds of informal uh, gatherings that commemorate the lives of ex-revolutionaries. So those are the three areas that I look at in the wider book project. And I'll focus in the formal part of the talk on kinship. So, let me take you briefly to the Far, which is today the southernmost province of the Sultanate of Oman. Uh, in area size, it covers a size similar to the US state of Virginia, with a population in 2010 of approximately 250,000 people. There's a very long and fascinating history of the Fard, which there isn't an opportunity to do justice to in, in this talk. I'm happy to open up in questions. I'm going to pick up that history in the 1950s, 1960s. At that time, the Sultan of Muscat was Sultan Said, who had a very, um, so he had, the Fard was a protectorate of the Sultan, a personal dependency of the Sultan. And he ruled it with a very firm grip. He was concerned that access to education might lead people to have ideas that would lead to political dissent. And so the Fadis had to flee to find opportunities for education and work uh, abroad. And indeed, some of those who fled for, to find those opportunities encountered Nasserist and Marxist ideas, politicized. And in 1965, people with various kinds of agendas coalesced into the Dofar Liberation Front, which began an armed opposition against the rule of Sultan Said. I'm going to recall this movement as I'm going to follow my interlocutors. They refer to it as the front, al Gabha. They get um, longer, um, the front changed names twice, and the acronyms get quite long. So I'm going to refer to the front. And from 1968, in the context of the uh, crisis of Arab nationalism and the socialist takeover of Aden, the Marxists within the movement became the leadership. And from that point on, the movement adopted in the areas that it was then controlling in the Far and in Yemen, in southern Yemen, where it ran a school and um, other training bases. They adopted Marxist-inspired projects for radical social change. Just to give a small sense of that, these are some pictures of um, taken from one of the glossy brochures produced by the front. Um, you know, uh, you know, to, to reach an outside audience, showing uh, what kinds of uh, programs they had and values they stood for. 
So here you can hopefully make out in this light um, a classroom scenario, um, so a literacy project, a mixed uh, audience, male and female uh, pupils, also the presence of weapons there. And again here to uh, female uh, students and also potential trainee uh, combatants. So just to give a sense of the, ide the social egalitarianist ideas driving many of their uh, programs, about access to uh, resources being more equitable, such as you know, water resources, wells, uh, access to literacy, um, opportunities to try and promote gender equality. And like many revolutionary movements of this ilk, the movement also targeted kinship, both because they saw that kinship had been an important way of reproducing the social, tribal, and ethnic hierarchies that they wanted to question, but also that Creating new kinds of families, for instance, promoting marriages between a socially high-ranking woman and a socially low-ranking man, which would have been avoided uh, normally um, in um, you know, families wouldn't have wanted their women to marry down, as it were. Um, so forging these new kinds of uh, marriages was another way of encouraging kinship, becoming a way of actually embodying and creating uh, these new kinds of social relations um, in spirit more egalitarian, um, at least in intention. So the counterinsurgency war uh, defeated this revolutionary movement formally uh, at the end of 1975. Um, Oman benefited from support from Iran, as we heard, uh, Britain, uh, Jordan. The front continued in exile in Yemen with some activities till the early 90s. From 1970, when Sultan Qaboos acceded to the throne, Former revolutionaries in various waves gave up allegiance to the revolution and surrendered and became loyal citizens of Sultan Qaboos, so moving back to Oman. And that was still going on in 2015 during my field work when people had encountered troubles in southern Yemen and um, there were still a few, you know, a handful of ex revolutionaries coming back. And Sultan Qaboos has offered different levels of material hands out to handouts to uh, ex-revolutionaries, depending on when they came back, how important they were in the revolution. And the fact that these um, amounts vary is seen by many of the Fadis as a divide and rule strategy to try and prevent uh, you know, a kind of cohort uh, um, solidarity amongst the ex-revolutionaries. There's a massive variation in their situation. Um, the uh, Minister of State responsible for foreign affairs, uh, Yusuf bin Alawi, is a former revolutionary. Um, other people in very high-ranking uh, positions in the government have also been that. They arrive with great um, you know, experience and education, and the very high-ranking ones could be very desirable um, for um, you know, high-ranking positions in Oman. Some people are eking by a very meager lifestyle, struggling to rent an apartment. So there's enormous variation. They're not one homogenous group. So I met mostly male veterans, and I met 26 of them. Um, and I'm happy to speak in questions as to why the women were more reluctant uh, to meet with me. I also met with more than 20 family members, and I visited 18 homes. And through conversations, hanging around, observation, so what we think of as participant observation of the ethnographic method, both with ex-revolutionaries and with families who didn't identify with an ex-revolutionary background, I was able to get a sense of comparison of the social dynamics of different kinds of gatherings. And so let me speak a little bit now about uh, some of the kinship practices. So. Um, the, some of the important kinship practices, patterns and traditions here, patrilineal tribes, um, not uh, all people through the male route would be born into maybe a client group that was then affiliated to a, a, you know, a prestigious tribe. And as I mentioned earlier, pressure on women not to marry down. So who women married was a very important kinship strategy for reproducing um, hierarchies between elites and um, client groups and across ethnic groups. There are Arabic speakers on the coast, but in the mountain hinterlands and some coastal areas, there are different ethnic groups that speak South Arabian uh, languages. So as I mentioned, the front had encouraged some socially unusual marriages of high-ranking um, women with low-ranking men. And the thing about marriages like that is that um, even if they haven't lasted due to divorce or death, 
they've produced somebody who is also going to be socially unusual because of that background. And so I had several instances where people talked to me about having realized that they could see a couple and that was their situation. And so one of the places that this could come out was in hospital wards. When people are sick, it's really important that everybody who knows them goes to see them and visit them. So a crowded hospital ward actually ends up with people from different social backgrounds doing different visits there. And so I'm going to tell you about Ali, a young man who was of college age when I met him, and how he was on a hospital ward and people, somebody spotted that his background had to be from the front. Ali's situation was that his mother was from the Sada, so the families who claim descent from the Prophet Muhammad. And uh, those families are well known across the region for not uh, tolerating normally for their daughters to marry non sada husbands. Nevertheless, in the revolution, this had happened, and Ali's father, who was from a South Arabian language-speaking mountain tribe, had married his mother during the revolution. They'd come back to Oman. <clears throat> Ali was born there in the early 80s, and his father died a few years after. And because his father died when he was so young, Ali was brought up in the urban Salala environment of his mother's family, speaking Arabic as his, as his first language, and learned the mountain language with an accent. And so he told me about how he was on a hospital ward and he was speaking with connections from his father's side, but speaking with an accent in, in, in this local language. And this is how I wrote up his story in my field notes. Another man on the ward saw me, noticed how I spoke, also how I looked, and asked me whose son I was. I gave a first answer. And then the man asked me whose son I was exactly, the bubbed and I gave my father's full name. The man, I didn't know him at all, came and hugged me and said that he was with my father in the front and that he had named his eldest daughter after my sister. Ali continued, the man asked about my mother. He had to ask about her. So this last point is significant because women of a high ranking social background like Ali's mother as a Sada, it's very important for them in the far. There's a lot of pressure that they shouldn't have their name and face circulating in public that would be seen as shameful for women of that uh, social background. And uh, by extension, for a man who is not related to her by kinship to ask about her, it would normally be an offensive suggestion of intimacy. And here Ali was defending it on the grounds of this background of camaraderie in the revolution. He had to ask about my mother. And I'm just going to mention a few other incidents very briefly to give you a sense that this isn't uh, uh, you know, an exceptional one-off. I also learned about, for instance, a hospital ward also being a chance to observe a marriage between a black man and a white woman and people reflecting and realizing, well, they must be from the front. That's the only explanation. Um, I also learned of a name given to girls um, in ex-revolutionary families it, the original name means a particular plant, and it wasn't used widely at all as a name in the Far. The first family to use it, the man explained to me that he'd chosen this plant name in homage to the rose behind Rosa Luxemburg, and then other revolutionary, ex-revolutionary families were naming uh, their daughter. This is all after the end of the war, um, naming their daughter after um, the first man's daughter. So there are all these, um, there's a kind of prolif proliferation of homages to Rosa Luxemburg. So this naming is a really significant strategy. If you think of the wider context in Oman, which is full of official named monuments for Sultan Qaboos, for his renaissance, his project of modernization and progress for Oman. <clears throat> so um, this becomes a way that ex-revolutionaries can make those networks amongst themselves visible uh, to other people who can recognize those names. So just to um, sum up on kinship practices before I conclude and look forward to your questions, um, these kinds of kinship practices preserve networks between ex-revolutionaries and they make them visible to uh, other ex-revolutionaries and sometimes to other people, as we saw in the crowded hospital wards. And also, these kinship practices were a way of passing some kind of familiarity with the revolution and people who've been important to the family through the revolution and um, passing that knowledge on to a new generation as they learned about who they or their siblings were named after. And also we can begin to see here how practices, daily practices such as kinship practices 
can recreate some of the questioning of dominant social hierarchies along tribal and gendered uh, and um, ethnicized and racialized lines. Um, for instance, asking about the unrelated uh, woman and that being seen as socially acceptable, um, harks back to those revolutionary projects about treating men and women as potentially equal uh, companions. And these uh, marriages of people from, if you like, socially odd combinations were living embodiments of how actually people were prepared to defend and, 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 and show it's okay to have these, um, to flaunt some of the um, hierarchies that we have of expectations of differentiation between blacks and whites, between uh, mountain and town tribes, between elites and non-elites. And to give you a sense that this was something that other Vifaris were aware of, this is um, the words of an interlocutor who didn't have a background in the revolution at all, but said to me, indeed, their culture is different, speaking about uh, ex-revolutionaries. So I'll just conclude briefly and uh, suggest that I believe that there is indeed a social afterlife of revolution in the Far, and we can think of this in that first sense of afterlife as a life after death, the life after defeat of this revolution. And I think it's important for thinking of what are the legacies of revolution, expanding those conversations to take into account um, the legacies that are still possible from defeated uh, revolutions, for challenging narratives about the success of patronage for um, uh, uh, quelling um, potential dissident voices uh, or uh, voices who you know, take a different view from the um, hegemonic patronage relationships, that actually people can still, whilst they're embedded with that, in parallel produce counter-hegemonic values, social values. And that one of the means for doing this is, I'm arguing, everyday forms of social interactions, such as the kinship practices that I've mentioned. And um, that um, is an important uh, addition to how we think of kinship and its potential. Often we've thought of it as a way of reproducing dominant uh, social values. Here it can help reproduce counter hegemonic values. And indeed, uh, thinking about how in the post-conflict scenario, actually everyday forms of relations might be a way of recreating the social world that you know is the, that fragile social world that came into being through political violence and i want to mention two other broader implications for thinking about the post-war and the wartime history of the far part of the narrative of the success of the counterinsurgency has been to suggest that the faris weren't really very attached to some of the revolutionary programs and agendas that it was a superficial engagement these lasting legacies suggest that there's more to that story, that at least some of them are interested in continuing uh, some of these uh, values and relationships. There's also the really important question of where does this stand in terms of, is it a form of resistance? This is a really important question. And we know from Abdel Habib that the Omani state does police what they consider to be unacceptable forms of resistance and sanction that. So the fact that all of this is going on and it, all these people, everybody who has a background in the revolution you know, is under surveillance. Um, surveillance is a wider condition in, in, in Oman more broadly, but um, I'm, leads me, the fact that all of this is going on and not policed leads me to conclude that the state does not find any cause for concern of, uh, that, that, that this, these practices could contain resistance of concern to the state. But there is this question of how might actually, in exceptional circumstances, something else erupt. And this takes us to the 2011 Arab Spring protests in Salala, which were the longest lasting protests in Oman of its uh, protests across different cities. <clears throat> and this takes us back to this question of could there be connections between defeated revolution and the later reemergence of platforms for progressive politics? And indeed, some of the protesters in Salala chanted, the one who forgets the 1970s should think of the grandchildren of the free men. Uh, so uh, certainly these protests were uh, repressed in the end by bringing in tanks and you know, arresting uh, hundreds of people. Um, so you know, the repression did come. But that protest slant, uh, chant gives us an insight into how some people did look back to this uh, past um, the 1970s, past and that history of that revolution, and found a language from there to legitimize and reinforce 
a future generation of claims uh, voiced to the government. And so um, Asif Bayat, in his recent uh, uh, book on the revolutions in the um, Arab world, has posited that it might be 10 or 20 years till we see the results of the revolutions in, in Egypt, for instance. And I think we can look to the far to suggest that actually this afterlife of defeated revolution can carry on even longer. Thank you.